be looking today at some of the errors that are creeping in on a widespread scale to the churches all over the world. And uh, so I'm really appealing to pastors to follow me. If you do find it rather deep and confusing, I, I don't apologize if you're not a pastor, but uh, I'll try and make it as clear as I can for you all to follow. I want to speak about grace in the first session this morning, because today we're looking, yesterday I expounded the truth, but I mixed in with it some exposure of error. Today, the emphasis will be a little different, and I'll be concentrating more on error. I'll still be expounding the truth where I can, but it's my job as a teacher to do both. It's wonderful to discover what your real calling is, and I discovered years ago I'm not an evangelist, though many people have come to Christ through my tapes, but I'm not an evangelist. I'm not an apostle. I'm not a prophet. I was a pastor, but basically I'm a teacher. When I was the pastor of various churches, my teaching was what I call pastoral teaching. That's what you do when you're speaking to the same people week in, week out, and year in, year out. Now, I would call myself a prophetic teacher because while I'm not able now, I don't have a pulpit, I'm not able to take people through the Bible or even a whole book of the Bible. And so as I travel, I have picked up burdens for the church and I bring the word of God to bear on those burdens and I share those burdens as I travel around. So I'm sharing some burdens this morning with you. There are three different understandings of grace which are widespread in the church today. One of them I believe to be the truth and I believe the other two are errors that are misleading people. I'll give you the three understandings straight away and then we'll talk about each one. The first understanding of grace defines it as undeserved favor. Undeserved favor. And that's the understanding that I believe is the biblical understanding. The second is irresistible force that grace is an irresistible force, that God uses grace to force you against your will to be one of his family. And the third understanding of grace is unconditional forgiveness. And it's those last two that I believe are a misunderstanding of biblical grace. Interestingly enough, in Indonesia, I was in Jakarta over the weekend, in Indonesia, the main misunderstanding seems to be the middle one, that grace is an irresistible force. Whereas in, here in Singapore, it's the third that seems to be the major problem here, the unconditional forgiveness understanding of grace. Let's start with the scriptural. Grace is a beautiful word, but in English it has too many meanings. I'll give you a funny one straight away. At the, I was born in the county of Northumberland, as was my friend Jono, who was just singing for us now. And off the coast of Northumberland, there are some islands called the Farn Islands. And on the outer part of the Farn Islands, there are a lot of very dangerous rocks. And there's a famous lighthouse been built to warn ships not to get onto those rocks. 
and at the end of the 19th century, the lighthouse keeper was a man called Darling, and he had a, a daughter in her late teens called Grace. And Grace Darling became the most famous woman in Britain in the Victorian era because she looked out of the lighthouse window one day and saw a steamship that had grounded on the rocks and was breaking up. And she saw a few members of the crew who had managed to scramble onto a, another rock. But the storm was very great and the great waves were crashing over the rocks. And she persuaded her father to get out a rowing boat and she and her father rowed that boat half a mile to the wreck and saved the lives of the people on the rock. And headlines all over the newspapers, over the whole nation, read, Saved by Grace. <laughs> Only they meant Grace Darling. And that became the sort of byword for our whole nation at the end of the 19th century. Well, I'm going to talk about saved by grace, but not by grace, darling. But we use the word in English for so many other things. We use it of ballet dancers, and we say they are very graceful, meaning they move with beauty and with gentle movements. And then if we owe money, and we can't pay it by the date due, we may ask for seven days grace, more time to pay it. Or if we have to finish a job and we haven't finished the job in time, we ask for, please give me some grace, meaning a little extra time to co complete the job. So we use it for so many different meanings. We use it even for a pleasing or a redeeming quality in an otherwise not very attractive personality. We say that's his redeeming grace. And so the English word really doesn't help us. We say it as a short prayer before a meal. Will somebody say grace? I don't know how it got into that. When you meet a duke or a duchess, like the new Duke of Cambridge and his new wife Kate, the Duchess of Cambridge, they now have the title, Your Grace. And bishops in the Church of England are always called Your Grace. I'm reminded of another funny story where a vicar had invited the bishop to come for lunch after he'd been preaching on Sunday in the church. And he told his family, now you must remember, before you address the bishop, you must say your grace. <laughs> and so when the bishop came in and was introduced to his little girl, she said, for what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. Now, all this is the mixed bag of meanings that have been poured into this word, but we want the Bible meaning. It's a lovely word in the Bible. It occurs 20 times in the New Testament. Of those, 16 are by St. Paul. So it's a word that had special meaning for Paul. And... Uh, that's where we get the full flavor of it from his writings. On the whole, evangelical Christians build their gospel on Paul's teaching primarily, and therefore grace is a word that is very commonly used by them. It's only used once in the Gospel of Luke about Jesus as a boy, that grace was upon him. But on the whole, it's used about God. It's used about God the Father, who is a God of grace. It is more often used about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Occasionally, 
The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Grace. But nearly all Paul's usage of the term applies to the second person of the Trinity, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's say that in the Bible there is no such thing as grace. No such thing. It is always embodied in a person. You can't point to anything and say that's grace. Just as there's no such thing as love, you can only find love in persons. And grace only exists in persons. And it clearly exists in all three persons of the Trinity. It's not used as an adjective, gracious in the Bible. It's used always as a noun, but it's an attribute of persons. Remember that. It doesn't exist by itself. And when you sing a hymn like Amazing Grace, it sounds as if it's a separate thing that does all that for you, but it's not. Grace doesn't exist except in persons, and it does exist supremely in our Lord Jesus Christ. But what does it mean? Why do we use it of him primarily? Well, there is one secular use of the term that gives us a clue. We have a queen in England, and she owns some big properties like Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle. But she also owns, and not many know this, she owns a lot of other houses. In fact, she's the richest woman in Britain. Some claim she's the richest woman in the world, but she's got a lot of property and a lot of houses. What does she do with them all? She gives them to her relatives and close friends free of rent. So if you're a cousin to the Queen, like the Duke of Kent, uh, she will give you one of those houses to live in, free of rent. And it's called a grace and favor residence. Now that's using it properly. It's very closely related to the word gift. It's something given away free. And so a grace and favor residence is a house rent free for you, a gift of the queen. And that's the real meaning. It's a favor that you do for someone else as a free gift. That's the essential meaning. But we must go on from that. It's got other kind of flavors with it that bring it alive. And the biggest flavor of the word grace is that it's a free gift given to people who don't deserve it. Now, the people who get a grace and favor residence from the queen, in a way they deserve it because they're relatives of her or have become our close friends. And this is their reward. But grace is not a reward. It is totally different from a wage which you have earned. No one can earn grace. No one can merit it. But it's even more startling than that. Grace is not only offered to people who don't deserve it, it is offered to people who've done everything not to deserve it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is offered to those who are his enemies. It was while we were his enemies that Christ died for us. Not only did we not earn it, we really had done everything not to deserve it. It's given to the worst kind of people. That's grace. And that gives it a unique flavor the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's never been anyone like him who has given so much 
to those who've done everything not to deserve it, to the worst kind of people. And therefore, he is the supreme example of grace and favor. So it's an undeserved favor. That's the essence of this beautiful word grace. And everything we just sang, you can substitute for the word grace, undeserved favor. It's got another flavor attached to it, that it takes the initiative, that it creates a relationship, that it takes the first step in creating that relationship. There's an initiative in grace. And God loved us before we loved him. And Christ died for us before we ever felt the need of anyone to do it. That's grace. And it became a benediction, a blessing in the early church. The love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus, and the fellowship of the Spirit became a benediction, a blessing to other people. And it's still used in many churches in that way. And what a blessing it is to know the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. That's the most blessed life you can have. Now, what is the response to grace that is appropriate? The answer is gratitude, thankfulness. And it's interesting that the word grace and the word gratitude are related. Another word for grace is gratuity. That's a rather long word for tip. When you give a tip to a taxi driver or a waiter who has served you, you call it in England a gratuity, a free gift added to what you pay. And gratuity and gratitude are the same word. And so very occasionally, even in the scripture, the word grace is applied to human beings who show gratitude for the grace they have received. Now, in the Greek language, the same thing applies. The word grace in Greek is charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, charis. And I'm sure you've heard of the word charismatic, which is based on the Greek word charismata, which means the gifts, the free gifts of the Spirit. And you've probably heard of the Greek word for thank you, which is eucharisto. And that has led many churches to call their celebration of the Lord's Supper a Eucharist. And all they mean, this is a very big thank you to Jesus for dying for us. And sometimes they say it and sometimes they sing it. And you'll see on the notice boards of some churches, sung Eucharist, 11 a.m. Sunday morning. Eucharist is simply saying thank you. And it's the word grace taken up in the middle of it and just a little bit added either side. So grace and gratitude are basically the same root word, and they go together. And the appropriate response to grace is gratitude. It is rarely applied to human beings, but when it is, it means a very thankful person who's overflowing with gratitude to God for the grace of his Son. Now, I think that's all I'm going to say at this point about what I believe is the Greek meaning of grace, the biblical meaning of grace. Charis, beautiful word. Only 20 times, that's not very often in the New Testament, is it? 
and 16 of those times in Paul's letters. Why did he major on that word? Because if ever there was an example of grace, it was Paul. When we first encounter him in the Bible, he is breathing out slaughter against the Christians. He's become an anti-Christian missionary, and he's left his home country of Israel to go after Christians elsewhere. And minutes after he stepped over the border of Israel on the Golan Heights at the foot of Mount Hermon, that is the road to Damascus, the capital of Syria. And it was right there, the minute he stepped outside his own land to go and put Christians in Damascus in prison and to stop their activities there, that moment Jesus met him and said, you've come outside your land to be an anti-Christian missionary. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He might have said, I'm not persecuting you, Jesus. I'm persecuting your followers. But he soon learned that in as much as you do it to the least of his, his brethren, you do it to him. And it was then that his understanding of Christians as the body of Christ came to birth. And he was transformed. And Jesus told him even then, I want you to go to the Gentiles. I want you to leave your country, but I want you to take the good news to them. My gospel, not, not your idea, my idea. Are you willing to do that? It's an amazing story that this anti-Christian missionary became the greatest missionary to the Gentiles there's ever been. And we still build our faith on his teaching. So he was an amazing example of grace. And not only that, but he wasn't one of the 12 apostles. He was one born out of due time, the last of them all. Number 13, and yet God included him. What grace God had shown him to the totally undeserving. And I believe that's the reason why Paul uses that word more than anyone else in the whole Bible. Carries grace. Well, now having said that, I must sadly now tell you that this word has been terribly misunderstood and therefore misapplied in churches around the world, even to this day. So let me now move into the more negative side of a teacher's task. The first meaning given to grace that is not biblical is that it is an irresistible force. And this meaning has a long history. It goes back to a man called Augustine, who was the bishop of a city called Hippo in North Africa in the fifth century. Saint Augustine, you've probably heard him called, because he was canonized by the Roman Church. And you may have heard of his Confessions, which is one of the first testimonies given. And it's a very wonderful testimony. But Augustine, I have to add, did the greatest damage to the Christian Church, both Protestant and Catholic, and has probably had more influence on the rest of church history right until this day by some of the things he taught. He had come from a pagan background. He'd been brought up in a pagan philosophy. And then he went to hear a preacher called Ambrose in Milan. And he came to Christ. But the actual conversion took place while he was reading 
Paul's letter to the Romans in a garden. He'd been a rather bad lad. He already had a mistress and an illegitimate son. And he'd played around. He acknowledges that in his confessions. But then he found Christ, and he famously said that we only find rest when we find Christ. Our souls can find no rest until we find it in thee, was his prayer. And so he became a Christian. He left his mistress. He made provision for his son and eventually became Bishop of Hippo. In his early years, everything went well. And when I read the early ministry of Augustine, I'm excited. It was good stuff. It was what the other early church fathers had preached. And then, halfway through his life, his early philosophical teaching began to creep into his teaching and changed it. In the early years, he taught and believed firmly that Jesus would come back to rule on earth. But in his later years, he just couldn't accept that. It was too physical, too earthly. And he began to react against his early immoral life and his sex life. And ultimately, we owe to him the fact that a whole church believed that its clergy should be celibate and unmarried. And he even taught later that sex within marriage was sinful, what he called concupiscence. And I find all this very sad because people who revered him as a church father followed his teaching right through. And it has affected both Protestants and Catholics ever since. But one of the things he began to teach was this, that it is legitimate to use force to make people Christians. And he built that on a, a text in the parable of the wedding feast, where the owner of the feast said, if those who are invited don't come in, then go into the highways and byways and compel people to come in. It's not a good translation. The word really means to persuade them. But he took it quite literally to compel them, make them come in, force them to come in. And from that teach, teaching, he also added that it's quite legitimate for us to use force to establish the Christian faith because God has used force. Grace is his force which he uses against our will to establish his kingdom on earth. And from the teaching of the legitimate use of force, in Christian affairs, which I am quite sure Jesus would have denied straight away. He said, my servants, don't fight. That's not what they're allowed to do. They don't use force to spread the faith. But came such things as the Spanish Inquisition, which tortured people until they accepted Jesus, especially Jews. And from his teaching came the Crusades, where soldiers set off to Jerusalem to set the Holy Land pilgrimage sites free from the Muslim invader. And so a whole lot followed from that teaching about grace as an irresistible force. He didn't actually call it that. That came rather later with the Protestant reformers. I apologize for all this history, but I think you need to know it to understand what's happened. Later in the 16th century, 
the Protestant reformers fed on Augustine's teaching, including his later teaching. Uh, Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk and therefore steeped in Augustine. Calvin in Geneva wrote two huge volumes called the Christian Institutes, and they are virtually Augustine's teaching brought up to date. They are solid Augustinianism. And so the Protestant reformers were directly influenced by Augustine's understanding of grace. We now blame Calvin more than we should for spreading that through the churches. What happened was Calvin followed Augustine in many ways, but Calvin died and was followed by his successor in Geneva called Theodore Beza, Beza, B-E-Z-A. -E and Beza took Calvin's teaching to its extreme and taught ultra-Calvinism. And he was the influence behind Holland. And Holland became a, dominated by the Dutch Reformed Church, which is solidly Calvinistic and therefore Augustinian, and therefore has this teaching of grace. And it, what Beza taught is what we generally call Calvinism, and I think that's a bit unfair to Calvin. I want to tell you about a man called Jacob Hermann Zoon. You've never heard of that, I'm quite sure. He was a Dutchman, and uh, he was brought up in Holland. He went to university there. While he was in university, the Roman Catholics killed his parents, and uh, that's part of the history of Holland. It was a tussle between Protestants and Catholics. But he came out a good Protestant, and he loved the Lord, and he loved the Scripture. And he was asked to be the pastor of the main church in Amsterdam, which was a royal city where the king and queen of Amsterdam lived. And he became pastor of the biggest church in Amsterdam, which I've been in. And there he preached the truth, I believe. He had, while he was in university, changed his name, which is why you've never heard of Jacob Hermann Zoon. It was the habit among students to change their name to a Latin word when they became students. And he remembered the name of a German who centuries before had fought against the Roman invaders and beaten them. And so he called himself by the Latin name of that German victorious fighter. And the name was Arminius. And that's where the name Arminius came from. That was his student Latin name. Now he lived such a godly and holy life that no one dared to criticize him while he was alive. But as soon as he was dead, some of the Dutch clergy arose and condemned him as a heretic. Few people have read his writings, I have, and I found myself thrilled to bits with, with his exposition of scripture. But then began a battle between the official Dutch Reformed Church, which was Calvinist, and the followers of Arminius, who were called Arminians. And that tension is still with us. And uh, that explains a lot. <laughs>
Anyway, he died, and so the elder clergy called together a synod in the town of Dort, and that conference is known as the Synod of Dort, and they produced five basic principles of their Calvinism, each one of which was aimed to deny the teaching of Arminius. Now, the five points of Calvinism that you need to know all relate to the five letters of the word tulip. By a strange coincidence, Holland is as famous for its tulips as Singapore is for its orchids. And they export millions of tulip bulbs around the world. And I want you to remember this tulip. It's not the prettiest tulip they've exported, but there are five basic principles they taught to deny the popular preaching of this holy man whom they had never dared to criticize before. And here are the five points of Calvinism. They shouldn't be called that because Calvin only taught three of them, but Beza added the other two. And these became the five points of Calvinism, which are still held by many pastors today. Let me run through them quickly. T, total depravity. And that means that we have sunk so low in sin that we have lost all our power to do good or to respond to good, even to accept the gospel. We are absolutely sunk in such depravity that we could never respond to Jesus by ourselves. The second you is unconditional election. And that means that God chooses people to be saved and he does not choose them with any regard to the people themselves. He doesn't choose them because they're going to be believers. He doesn't choose them because they're going to be anything. He chooses to save people because he chooses them. And he has not told us why he chooses some and not others. For the big question I want to ask a Calvinist is how do you explain that some are saved and some are not. And their explanation is God has chosen some and not others. Which means logically that he's chosen some for heaven and chosen some for hell. And it's his choice. And he hasn't told us why he made that choice. It's totally unrelated to us. It means that speaking from our point of view, Salvation is purely luck. It is purely arbitrary. It's not related to anything in us whatsoever. God has simply chosen one person and not another. And that's why that one is saved and not this one. Unconditional election. The third, the letter L, means limited atonement. And that is based on the logic that God would never punish anyone twice for sin and therefore either he can't send anybody to hell because he's already punished Jesus for their sin or Jesus didn't die for everybody but only for the elect. And that's what limited atonement means. Now Arminius said Jesus died for everybody. He paid the price for the sins of the whole world. But the Calvinist says, no, he didn't. If he sends anybody to hell after that, he's punishing twice. It's logical, and Calvinism is very logical. But it's not necessarily true. So, total depravity, we can do nothing about our salvation at all. God has to do everything. Unconditional election. He doesn't choose us for anything in us, not even our faith. He chooses us before we believe. 
In fact, he chooses us and gives us the new birth even before we repent and believe because we are so totally depraved that we can't repent till we're born again. And God leads us to new birth before we know anything about it. And then we repent and then we believe. You may think this is extraordinary teaching, but this is the teaching on grace that is in many churches. I found this in Indonesia, but I don't think it's prevalent here in Singapore. Not very widely anyway. I've got two more letters. I, and here it comes, irresistible force sorry, irresistible grace. That's what I meant when I said it's an irresistible force. Grace cannot be resisted. If grace decides that you will be saved, you will be saved. If grace gets a hold of you, you will be kept. It's not dependent on your decision or will or faith or anything. You will be saved, you will be kept, you will be in heaven because God decided and his force is greater than anything in you. And so that brings us to the fifth point, perseverance of the saints. If God's grace is irresistible, then it can keep you against your will. Whatever you do, you will land up in heaven because God has chosen you and you can do nothing about that. Now those are the five things that grew out of grace as an irresistible force. And they are the five points of Calvinism. You'll find them in the Presbyterian churches. You'll find them in what are called the Reformed churches. And you'll find those five things theoretically taught anyway in a number of the world's Calvinistic denominations, as they're called. I'm trying to be as fair as possible to them, uh, but I think I've been fair. Compel them to come in. God compels us to be saved. He compels us to be kept. He compels us all the way along the line. And therefore, we can use the same compelling people by force to bring them into the kingdom because God, God wants us. He'd rather have people compelled in than persuaded in. I believe that's a libel on God. Now, let's go back to Augustine for a moment. Augustine had someone who opposed him very sharply, a man called Pelagius. And I'm quite sure the pastors here will have heard of Pelagius. He was a British monk who went to Rome and was alarmed at the corruption in the Church of Rome people who were rel relying on God's force to keep them and were not holy people. They didn't need to be. God's force would get them to heaven. And so he reacted against this, I'm afraid, too strongly. And he went to the opposite extreme and so stressed human responsibility that no room was left for God to do anything. In other words, he said, it's entirely up to you whether you are saved or not. You can save yourself. He would quote verses like Peter on the day of Pentecost who said, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And he taught DIY salvation, that it's something you do not God. And that was the big argument, and I think Augustine was reacting 
to the other extreme to Pelagius and was writing books against Pelagius. I thank God that there were some people in the middle of all that. The French bishops said, both of you are wrong. And they stood right in the middle and they said, salvation is the result of human cooperation with the divine. It's what's called nowadays synergism. That means working together. And so the middle group, the bishops of France said, it is God who saves, but not against our will. We need to respond to grace. We need to receive the gift of grace. And when we respond to grace in gratitude and receive the gift of salvation, we are saved. And the reason why people are not saved is not because God hasn't chosen them, but because they haven't chosen to receive the gift. And that was their explanation as to why some are saved and some are not. And I would stand with the French bishops. I wouldn't stand with Pelagius who said, it's all your doing. And I wouldn't stand with Augustine who said, it's all God's doing. I would say that when a person responds to grace by repenting and receiving, repenting and believing, they then receive the gift of salvation. I want to try and put this difference in a simple picture. I want you to imagine someone being saved from drowning. The Calvinist would say the man is floating in the water already dead. He has drowned. He is totally unable to do anything. And it needs someone to fish him out of the water and give him the breath of life to save him. That's Calvinism in a nutshell. The Arminian and the most middle French bishops would say, the man is not able to swim to the shore. He is drowning and he will be lost. But if someone will throw him a rope and say, get hold of the rope and I'll pull you to the shore, he will be saved. Now, can, I'm putting that as simply as I can. One says the man can do nothing for himself, he's dead, he's drowned. And someone must dive in and pull him out and then give him the breath of life, the kiss of life or whatever. But the other is saying, no, he is drowning and he will drown and be lost. But we must, God throws him the life belt maybe on the end of a rope and says, take hold of this and I'll pull you safely to the shore. That's the picture of Arminius. And I believe that's the picture you get in the New Testament. That's how they preached. They said, repent and believe and God will pull you to heaven. Grab the gospel, get hold of it. That's all you've got to do, but you get hold of it and you'll be pulled to safety and therefore to salvation. It's the difference between saying God does it all and saying God does it all for the people who respond. And Arminius taught that the human response to the grace of God is necessary for salvation. And they said that's why some are saved and some are not. Some grab hold of it and find that they're saved. And others will not get hold of it. They turn it down. In simple English, grace can be refused according to the Arminian. According to the Calvinist, it cannot be refused.
In other words, even simpler, you can say yes or no to grace. No one is forced to accept grace. It is a free gift, undeserved, but a gift has to be received and a gift has to be used and relied on. It requires cooperation to become useful and effective. Now I'm trying to be as clear and simple as I can and I think I can't make it simpler than that. And sooner or later, you've got to decide if grace means that God does everything and is solely responsible for anybody being saved, or whether it is that some have responded, received the gift, and that it's become theirs, and they're very grateful. Well, when I studied my Bible, they were offering grace but they were demanding repentance and faith. They were demanding a response from people. They were not thinking God will save whom he wants to save, and that's it. I've got many dear friends who are Calvinists, and I just thank God that some of them keep their Calvinism in the study and don't take it into the pulpit. Because when I listen to some of them preach, they're preaching a grace that needs to be received. Even though in theory they think that only those who are chosen by God will receive it, they, they are at least offering the gospel to other people. That's great. Well, now this is the second thing. So you had Augustine and Pelagius in tension, and each going to an extreme. Later you had Calvinism and Arminianism in tension. I don't think Arminianism went to an extreme, however, in that later tension. But we have inherited 2,000 years of church history. And if you don't know anything about church history, you will be puzzled by the differences between the churches. And that's why I have written a little book called Where Has the Body Been for 2,000 Years? And its subtitle is A Church History for Beginners. It's quite small, but it takes you through 2,000 years. What's happened today? Well, the Dutch Reformed Church, which is very Calvinistic, colonized Indonesia, next door to you. And that's why you have so many Presbyterian churches over there. And this kind of teaching that I've been sharing with you was planted with the Dutch colonizers. But Singapore was colonized by the British. And so you have the first of all, the Anglican church, with its white cathedral in the middle of the town. And the cathedral itself is modeled on Roman Catholic Gothic architecture. It comes from the Middle Ages because the Church of England is a muddle. But then the British are usually in a muddle. <laughs> and I'm afraid we are characteristically comprehensive muddle. Do you know the Church of England was founded on the fact that King Henry VIII couldn't get a divorce from the Pope. So he cut himself off from the Pope, announced himself head of the Church of England, destroyed every Roman Catholic monastery in England, and the Queen is now head of the Church of England in his place. And the Church of England decided to settle for a mixture of Catholic and Protestant. Scotland didn't. Scotland followed Calvin and the Presbyterians, but England became the good old Church of England, and it's such a mixture that some churches are higher than the Roman Catholic Church, and the other Anglican churches are lower than the lowest. <laughs> 
it's an extraordinary mixture. And so we finish up with high Anglicans, broad Anglicans, and low Anglicans. Or in theological terms, Catholic Anglicans, liberal Anglicans, and evangelical Anglicans. What a muddle. And if you study the 30, 39 articles of the Church of England, it is mildly Calvinist, but only mildly. But it's on that side of things, but only just. What a mixture that is. And so in the 18th century, when the official Church of England was dying, spiritually, many would say it was dead spiritually, but not quite, there arose a two brothers called John and Charles Wesley, who led a revival in Britain in the 18th century, from which came the Methodist Church. And John Wesley had a magazine, which he started for his people. Guess what it was called? It was called the Arminian. And so you've inherited the Methodist Arminianism and the Anglican mild Calvinism from the British occupation of Singapore. <laughs> so you've got that mixture over here. But there it is. I hope, as I said at the beginning, that those of you who are not theologically interested are not just getting totally confused and bewildered and being shaken in your faith. I have prayed early this morning that the Holy Spirit would protect your faith from being confused and uh, disturbed by what I have to teach. But you see, we are inheriting 2,000 years of church history. And without realizing it, we've inherited traditions through the different churches. And we've inherited different understandings of grace. And that affects your whole thinking. It affects your evangelism. It affects so much. In practice, most evangelists are Arminian and preach for a response believing that if people respond to the gospel, they will be saved. And therefore, most evangelism is done by people with strong convictions about the first understanding of grace as undeserved favor, a free gift for the very undeserving, but a gift that must be received and used. We not only need grace at the beginning of the Christian life, we need grace all the way through. That's why Paul prayed so much that God would heal him of a physical infirmity that he believed was a handicap to his mission. And God said, no, I'm not going to take it away. My grace is sufficient for you and in your weakness, I can be strong. Grace will see you right through to the end. And when we've been there a thousand years, we'll still be singing about it, how undeserved our salvation was. But it wasn't because we did nothing. Theoretically, if someone says to a Calvinist, what must I do to be saved? He should be told absolutely nothing. If God has chosen you, he will save you. Which is why many Calvinists suffer from a loss of assurance. Has he saved me? Am I sure? And that's awful if you're not sure whether God has called you. Because those who've responded to his call know God called them. Well, we could stay with that a long time, but your major 
problem in Singapore is not irresistible force. It's unconditional forgiveness. And I have to say that this third understanding of grace, which can be found in America, is spreading throughout the world from this city. And I came across it all over South Africa when I was there two years ago. And I said, where, where did you get all this from? And they said, Singapore. So I must be honest and share with you what I believe is a misunderstanding of God's beautiful grace in interpreting it as unconditional forgiveness. It's good in the sense that it gives God glory for his grace, for his free grace, but it's bad because it takes that free grace to an extreme teaching in two particulars. First, in teaching that when you come to Christ, all your future sins are forgiven as well as your past. Now, I can't find any trace in my Bible of God forgiving sins that have not yet been committed, either before or after conversion. We're not immediately perfect, and Christians do sin, but we know what to do about that. In the first chapter of John, we have very clear instruction. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And the blood of Jesus will go on cleansing us from all unrighteousness. And that's a promise for Christians. It's the first chapter of 1 John which is written to believers. And it tells them if you sin, we have an advocate in heaven to speak for us, but we need to do our part and we need to confess. And when we do so, he is faithful and just to go on forgiving, that's the tense of the verb, and the blood of Jesus goes on cleansing. We know what to do when a Christian sins. We take it to the Lord and get it dealt with. We keep short accounts with God so that we don't get into debt to him. And we deal with sin as it arises and we get his dealing with it, his forgiveness by confessing it. Now that's a very important scripture. So what do these people who say, God has forgiven all your future sins do with that chapter? I was astonished to find they deny that it was written to Christians. And they say it was written to pagans, the first chapter of John. And when you read that letter, everything in it is clearly addressed to Christians. And to twist that scripture and make it something only for pagans is almost laughable, but it's so serious that it's not. It's denying what Scripture is saying. That's unconditional forgiveness. When you come to Christ, all your sins are forgiven, not just everything you committed in the past, but everything you will yet commit in the future. So don't get morbid and think about your sins. That's the kind of teaching that comes out of that. That's tragic teaching. It may make a lot of people happy, but it is not the truth. We can go on being forgiven as long as we confess and ask. And Christians do make mistakes, Christians do fall, but we know that it can be dealt with immediately and properly and taken away. Jesus didn't come just to save us from hell. He came to save us from our sins. 
He came to go on dealing with our sins. He dealt with all our past sins. They were washed away in baptism. That deals with your past. But the one thing John the Baptist was worried about is that while baptism dealt with the past, it didn't help with the future. And I can remember my baptism, which was in a dirty green pool, but I felt clean. And I knew that my past was washed away. But I can remember vividly the first sin I committed after that. I made the silly mistake of thinking I'd undone it all. But baptism only deals with your past. It doesn't deal with your future. That actually needs the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's no good just having your past cleaned up if you have no help with your future. Because being sinners still, the old man may be dead, but he's not lying down. And you live in this tension between the old man and the new man. And you do sin, but it can be dealt with. And 1 John 1 tells you very clearly how to deal with it when it happens. You don't need to be baptized again. That washed your past clean and got you properly started with a new clean life. But later, you will need still to deal with things that hang on and things that come from the pressures of being in a sinful world. But they can be dealt with now, and they don't need washing away in baptism again. They need to be confessed. The other thing that follows from this is a downplaying of repentance. Unconditional forgiveness doesn't really depend on repentance. In my understanding of Scripture, unrepented sin can't be forgiven. That we need to repent first, and then that sin can be forgiven. And to repent isn't just saying sorry. It's doing something. Both repentance and faith, in my understanding of Scripture, are things that we do. But both the Calvinists and the uh, free grace, as it's sometimes been called, Dietrich Bonhoeffer called it cheap grace. This third understanding of grace tends to downplay anything that we need to do. And repentance and faith are things that we need to do. So, on the whole, repentance is not often mentioned. It is downplayed. And yet for Paul, this was absolutely central to his preaching. There is one verse in the New Testament I've never heard a preacher deal with. It goes like this. And so I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. It's part of Paul's testimony. You all know that verse, don't you? Have you heard that quoted? I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. But most people stop there and they don't quote the rest. I've never heard the rest quoted. I've heard that bit quoted. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. But it immediately goes on, so I did what? I won't check you out, but put your hand up if you think you could tell me. Anybody. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, so I preached repentance to the Gentiles that they should turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. 
Why don't preachers ever preach that? That repentance is something you prove by your deeds. That's what Paul used to preach. He said to the people of Athens, until now God has winked at your sin. He has overlooked it. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. That was his preaching. It was basic. Repent, repent, repent. Just to lighten things up a bit, I'll tell you about a young man who came to see me on a motorbike. Big motorbike with handlebars up here and mirrors stuck out all over the place. And I heard him coming a mile off. Brum, brum, and he stopped at our front door. And he rang the bell and I opened the door and he said, I want to talk. I said, well, if you want to talk, come on in. And he came in in black leather clothes covered with brass studs. And he sat down on our settee in the room and it still bears the marks of uh, Paul's visit. And he made himself comfortable and I said, what do you want to talk about, Paul? I want to be baptized. I said, you want to be baptized? I said, you know how we baptize people? He said, yeah, you duck them in the water. I said, so you want to be ducked in the water? Yes. I said, Paul, do you know what the word repent means? He said, no, nah, I never heard it. I said, now listen carefully, Paul. I want you to go home and I want you to ask Jesus this question. Just say, Lord Jesus, is there anything in my life that you don't like? And when he tells you something, I want you to cut it out and come back and tell me. And he didn't come back for three weeks. And then I heard the, bib, the bike again and boom, boom, there's, there's Paul on the doorstep. So I opened the door and he said, there. I said, what do you mean, there? I've stopped biting my nails. <laughs> I said, right, Paul, I'll baptize you now. And he never looked back. He'd become a great Christian. Do you know some of you were baptized and you weren't even asked that? I baptize people on proof of repentance, not on profession of faith. That's more biblical. Repent and be baptized. And you may laugh at him, but you know, when Jesus told him to stop biting his nails, he repented. And he stopped. And that was good enough for me. And he learned then that when you're aware of sin, you stop it and you deal with it. You repent. I think at the root of these two misunderstandings is the fear of the word works. We are saved by faith, not by works. But you know, there's a phrase in the New Testament, I'm going to read it to you without telling you where I'm getting it from or who I'm getting it from. But here it is. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. That's the word of God. Notice, not by faith alone. That is the only place in the Bible where you'll find the words by faith alone, but you'll find the word not in front of them. Many people think 
It's by faith alone. It isn't. And in fact, the very word used in that verse is, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Actually, I was reading from James 2. But people who have this third misunderstanding of grace don't like the epistle of James one little bit because the key word in James is do. And they believe that anything we do is what the Bible means by works. That's not true. Paul was right when he said we are not saved by works of the law. And Paul was right to say if we're not saved by good works, by good deeds, by trying to be good. He was absolutely right. But faith has works attached to it, works of faith. And James goes on to talk about Abraham was justified by faith when he offered Isaac to the Lord. And Rahab the prostitute in Jericho was justified by faith when she received the Israeli spies into her home and hid them in a brothel and then safely sent them out another way back to the Israeli army. And the spies of Israel told her, when we take Jericho, hang a scarlet cord from your window and we'll tell our troops that you're safe. And her house was on top of the wall of Jericho. That's how she could hang a scarlet cord from the window to be seen. So not all the wall of Jericho fell down. One bit of it stayed up and was the house of the prostitute Rahav, or Rahab we call her. In both a good man called Abraham and a bad woman called Rahab, in both cases, they were justified by faith that acted, faith that did something. Whereas again, those who take this wrong view of grace tend to say faith is what you say, not what you do. Name it and claim it, or blab it and grab it, or whatever <laughs> term you use. That is the teaching that goes alongside this misunderstanding of grace. I think I'm saying enough for you to recognize this error when you come across it. It is widespread. It originated in America but it's got a huge hold here in Singapore and is spreading through the internet throughout the world. And everywhere I go to preach, I come across it. So please have discernment, you pastors. Recognize these errors which are distorting the truth of God. I think I've probably said enough on grace to show you what the true understanding is and what the two major false understandings are today. And they are very widespread. We are told in scripture that towards the end of this age, the greatest danger for Christians will be deception. And we are not deceived by lies. We are deceived when truth is mixed with error. The devil, if he told outright lies, we'd, we'd simply say no to him. But the devil is so clever, he deceives people by mixing the truth in with it. And the error of grace that I've mentioned is often mixed in with the true gospel and with many true things that are being preached with it. And it's the mixture that deceives. That's been true ever since the Garden of Eden. What Satan said to Eve 
was half true. And she swallowed it. He said, if you take this fruit, your eyes will be opened. That was true. And you will be like gods. And that was not true. And it was the mixture that fooled Eve and Adam, who was standing by her side at the same time. And ever since, the devil, who is far cleverer than us, has persuaded people to mix the truths of the gospel with some things that are not true. And it's that mixture that is so deceptive it sounds most of the time as if you're listening to the truth. But if you listen carefully, there are things being slipped in that have no biblical basis. And that's where the danger lies. And as we get near the end of time, the devil gets more desperate. And that's why five times in just one chapter, when Jesus told us what the end would be signaled by, what to watch for, after each sign he gave them, he said, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Paul does the same. When he writes to Timothy, he says, this is what will happen in the last days. Men will be lovers of pleasure. People will want preachers who tickle their ears and tell them what they want to hear. Watch and pray lest you be deceived. When we read the scriptures, I'm afraid we have to face the fact that it's not all straightforward and the deception will take place inside the church. And tragically, will affect the Christian living of so many people. Well, go to a church that preaches the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and guard your hearts against the subtle mixture that deceives and destroys. Amen.